Good morning, church family, and welcome to Church Online here at Newport Pagnell Baptist Church. Whether this is the first time that you've been with us or the hundredth time that you've been with us, you are so welcome, and it is good to see you. And it's good to see you, Ali, this morning. Nice Thank to have you with us. Thank good you very to much. See you. Good to see you. So Ali's going to be helping us lead this morning, and 
we're going to do things a little bit differently as we start this morning because we were always going to be sharing in the bread and the wine this morning in sharing in communion in the meal that Jesus invited us to share with him and I felt we're, we're going to be thinking a little bit about worship today and what it means and particularly as we think about coming back to the building well I thought we'd start around the table and I know we don't normally do that I know you're sitting at home straight away thinking oh no it's normally at the end of the service well we're going to do it at the start today and so we're going to sing in a moment and that's going to help us to prepare our hearts for the uh, to share in the bread and the wine and it's also a chance if you at home aren't quite ready for that yet to make sure that you've got some bread and some wine or some juice so that you can share in that with us but as we kind of make our way towards uh, towards the table, towards remembering what Jesus did for us. Ali, you're going to read to us from uh, John's Gospel, I think. Yes. Yeah. So it's John chapter 13, verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Amen. Amen. So there we've read that that's from the Gospel of John, the good news of John. And he's recounting the events where Jesus had washed the disciples' feet. And then it's the few moments after it. And he says those words that no servant is greater than his master. And as we think about worship today, so often we come and we think, well, worship is simply about coming and uh, proclaiming our adoration for God, wanting to tell him how great that he is. But it's also about recognising in our whole lives that there is someone who is greater than we are. And the very way that we live our lives enables others to see that. And that's also partly what communion is it is it's coming together and thanking God but saying Lord you are greater than anything I am or could ever be let's worship together in song how great is our God Oh, God. 
Amen. How great is our God. And we're just going to read some words as we prepare to share in the bread and wine. We're just going to read some words from Matthew chapter 26, which tell us of the first time that Jesus came with his disciples and shared in this simple meal. Let me read these to you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Dying 
Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting us to share in your communion. And um, I pray that we will never take that for granted, that invitation, that even though we have perhaps done this countless times, that today it's, it's a new time and it's, a, it's an opportunity to, um, to, to do it again with such thankfulness in our hearts to, for everything that you have done for us. Thank you for your sacrifice um, on the cross. And thank you, God, that you have given us an opportunity and a way to um, come to you and to have a relationship with you. Um, we just, we never want to, to get bored of saying those words. And we just are so grateful each time that we have this opportunity to do this. Um, so yeah, I pray that you will bless us as a church family through this act um, and that we can just... Um, yeah, share, share in your body and your blood and just thank you for, for all that you have done for us. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ali. So church family, we have an opportunity to, to share in the bread and the wine together. Now, let's be honest, it's still a bit weird. You know, this was never the way that was the communion that that act of coming together with, with, with Christ and one another was meant to be. It was, you know, if we think back to that first, uh, the first or the last supper that we read about of Jesus and his disciples, it was there in a room with them. It was an intimate moment. But I believe in a God who's bigger than uh, needing us in a room to be able to connect us together for, or for us to be able to connect with him. And so I believe, church family, today that as we share in the bread and the wine together, we are doing that as the body of Christ, both one with him and one with each other. So let me encourage you just once again, just to make sure that you've got the bread and the wine or the juice uh, ready. Because today we come and we are Jesus's disciples. We are the friends that he chooses to share this meal with. Everyone is welcome. And I, I, I still find it amazing, I think even as we reflect on it here, that even with all our flaws, even with all the, stu the stuff we mess up on, we still have a saviour who says, no, 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 come on, come to the table. Um, and it's a place to worship. It's a place to remember who he is and what he's done for us, as you, as you said in the prayer that you led us in, Ali. So we're going to take the bread. Ali, I invite you to take your bread too. We're going to take our bread. And church family, if you want to pick your bread up as well at this point. And we take the bread and we break it just as Jesus did for his disciples. As he said to them, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. And so we take a piece of the bread. And we eat together. And then church family, just as Jesus did, as he shared with his disciples, he took the wine. And they would have had one cup, but we've, we've, <laughs> we've got two for obvious reasons. And the Bible says, in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. And so we drink together. One in the love and worship of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Church family, I invite you to watch this short video that will lead us in a time of prayer.
Amen. Wasn't it good to be able to share in communion together? And church family, I promise you, it's coming soon when we'll be able to sharing it together in the building. Um, I've got Emma with me now. So uh, Ali has changed into Emma. So hello, Emma. Good to see you. Hi. Good to be here. Yeah. And Emma has new glasses today. I do. You might I notice. Do. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emma... One of the reasons that I uh, wanted you to come along today was because I know there are a lot of people out there who who are watching and thinking, I hear a lot about these Sunday mornings back in the building and, you know, it's socially distanced and what's, is it really like church or isn't it? And you were here for the first Sunday last week, weren't you, when we came back together? And I thought, wouldn't it be good if rather than people listening to me, I got somebody else to, to maybe share what your experience of last Sunday morning yeah. was. So. Um, I have to say, we, we came together, David and I and Joel, and uh, we pulled up to the building. It was nice to just pull up on a Sunday yeah. morning again. Just even that was nice. Yeah. Uh, and then we walked through the door um, and had a lovely greeting. David explained uh, exactly what to expect as you walk through the door. So which that's was David great. Wright. David, David Wright. Wright. Yeah. 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 Uh, he explained what to expect. And uh, we had a, um, a three seats together with our name on it, with the beanie name on it. And uh, uh, really well organised in that sense of just feeling like uh, you could just walk in the door and just rest and relax. And I think that's what I would say. It was a really relaxed place to be full of joy because you could see people's faces good, yeah. and um and just being able to be together uh was was just yeah it did it did us all good i have to say um and uh just being just being together um yeah. even how, though it was different how, how did you deal with the no singing right because that was a yeah, yeah i see nice. i'm a, yeah i like to so <laughs> Uh, tapping. <laughs> um, we encourage tapping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and just your heart, really, isn't it? So when you're listening to what's happening and, and the song and the music and the words, it's engaging with that in a process of just saying, Lord, I'm here, and just opening up opening up to, to him in that process. And so, um, yeah, a bit strange not singing, but actually just so good to be in the room still yeah i must admit i've found it it's just different and it it, you know in some ways i reflect more on the words maybe than i do when i'm singing them yeah Uh, yeah it's it's just a different experience it is so so emma what would you say if people are sitting at home and they're thinking do i sign up for this do i come along on a sunday or not what would you say to to people i think that um we want you, I mean, obviously, we want you to be ready to want yeah. to come back. Uh, but I, I would have to say that it was good to be together. And, uh, and it was, there's something about um, coming to church on a Sunday morning that I just, as we pulled up in the car, it was just like, it was so good. It was yeah. so good. And I know it's not the same. Uh, at the moment, but actually it was good to be together. Good to see uh, people around you, f- familiar faces and new faces. And so people that we've seen on screen, but not actually met yep. in real life, yep. uh, has just been lovely <laughs> in real life. too, you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and just be able to have some uh, conversation uh, with people. Uh, it was just, it was a real blessing. Good, thank you. Well, there's encouragement for you, church family, from a real person, uh, someone who I can see in real life. I promise you that uh, Emma is really here. Um, and just, we want you back in the church building. And as, as Emma has said, that's got to be at the right time for you. Um, but we'd love to see you. And we think that the, the experience that you'll have here will be a, will be a really positive one. Um, some of you will know as well that Emma, you, you became an elder. Yes. recently yeah. and and worship is the area that you're looking after um and, and i've got oversight for we're thinking a little bit about worship today um if you don't mind share with us just a bit of your heart 
as you come into that role and you think about, well, worship at MPBC, what, what should that be like? What should, you know, tell us, just share with us you know, a bit of that. I just, I th I, when it comes to worship, it's about creating opportunity to connect and meet with God and to... Uh, to give our ad ad adoration to God, you know, creating opportunity for that to happen in different spaces. Yeah. And um, uh, particularly at the moment when we're all in slightly different places ourselves. Um, and so it's sort of creating those opportunities for us to come together, draw together and worship God for, for all that he is Amen. and all that he has been. And so uh, those opportunities are, are going to be uh, something that I think is important uh, in different ways so the Holy Spirit can move as only yeah. he can yeah. and, um, and, and that we can, we can pray and we can come and we can gather and so opportunities for that to happen um, and, and different expressions of worship um, that are, are different for all of us and so that's, that's important too but a passion for his name to, to sort of just come and worship him for all, all that he is in our lives um, and there's something about being together when we do that that is just uh, just just so wonderful yeah Emma thank you it was just even sitting here and hearing you say all that I'm like yes let's let's have some of that and I'm, I'm grateful that Emma is on the team I really am Emma just even in the conversations that we've had over the last few weeks I'm excited for what God is going to do through yeah. the leadership team here through you Emma and uh, so thank you for coming and being with us today Thank and you for uh, me. we will see you again soon. Yeah, All thank right. you. Thanks, everyone. So, church family, we, uh, we're going to get into the word. Uh, before we do that, though, I just want to update you because I've had a couple of people ask me about, are we expecting Peter about now, um, our new associate pastor? And uh, the good news is, yes, we are expecting Peter, and not just Peter either, but Nicola and Adam and Emily, the whole family. Uh, they are very close to joining us. Um, so there's been a, a, there was a slight delay this week on just the, uh, the move going through quite as quickly as they would have hoped. Um, but we are hoping that they will be with us in the next 10 days or so. And uh, that means uh, just an opportunity again to rejoice and to thank God for bringing them as a family to us. And then we'll see what God has lined up for us all together. But uh, yeah, I can't wait. And I'm sure you can't either uh, for the moment that Peter's going to join us uh, on the famous sofas uh, for the first time um, or second time or whatever. Anyway, so let's get into the word and let's start. I've got a question for you. Are you someone who, when they've watched a film, regardless of maybe how good or bad that film is, would never even consider wasting their time watching the same film again? Or are you someone who loves to watch the same film over and over and over again, enjoying the highs and the lows, perhaps even laughing or crying in the same place every time. I know anybody at Christmas time who watches It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know about you, I'm guaranteed tears. I know what's coming, but I'm guaranteed tears. What about holidays? What about holidays or places that you might visit? Once you've visited a place, do you tick it off the list and decide that you're never going to go back there again and you just want to get on to the next location? Or do you love going back to the same place again and again because you enjoy the familiarity? Of course, at least with a holiday, you can choose to do different things in the same resort or city or maybe even go with different people and that adds a different flavour to it. What am I getting at when I'm asking those questions? Well, First off, we're all so different. We're all very different. So you're not being judged this morning by your answers to those questions, okay? I want you to feel comfortable about that. But I do also want to say that sometimes I sense we're all a bit, we can be too quick to want to move on to the next thing. We think we've exhausted something. And in our rush to get on to the next thing, we miss the layers that exist, the encounters 
that might still be waiting for us. The details that only become clear when we dwell in something. The opportunity to explore what wasn't immediately obvious the first time around. A chance to take a different route to the same place. The opportunity to savour something that's worth savouring. I often think it's true of worship. In fact, you may recall that even earlier this morning as we prepared to share in the bread and wine, that was exactly how Ali prepared us for it. By talking about the fact that it's something that we come to so regularly and yet just because of that, we shouldn't miss the beauty, the importance, the significance of what it means to be able to share in those moments. I'm a big believer that there's always something to be had in whatever experience when we choose to come back for a second time or a third time. But even more so when it comes to worship, getting the opportunity to celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God again and again and again. Which is partly why, having spoken a little bit about worship last week, we're here again. I've got no apologies for that. We're going to savour it. And we're going to start by reading from Ezra. Ali's going to read to us from Ezra chapter 6, beginning at verse 13. Then, because of the decree King Darius had sent, Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates and Shethar Bothanai, and their associates carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, a descendant of Iddo. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month, Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, 200 rams, 400 male lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what is written in the book of Moses. On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their relatives, the priests, and for themselves. So the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbours in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the festival of unleavened bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria, so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. Amen. So we've had another insight into the people of Israel as they return from exile. And as we get into God's word, as we seek to just explore it a bit more to see what God has to say to us this morning, I'm just going to pray as we do that. Father God, I pray that you will take those words that we have just read and you will enable them through your Holy Spirit to speak into our lives this morning. You'll enable it, them to speak into our individual lives. And I pray, Lord, that you'll also enable them to speak into the life of this church, that we will know your voice speaking clearly to us, sharing with us the path that you would have us follow, Father God. And if there's anything that I say as we go into these words today, Lord, I pray that if there's anything that I say that isn't of you, you'll just delete it. Because I pray that we as your church, as your people, might only hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you might remember that last week we took a look at Ezra chapter 3. And Zerubbabel was leading the people to rebuild the altar. The very minimum the people needed for worship. 
And then they worshipped. Boy, did they worship at that altar in response to God's faithfulness with a whole range of emotions coming out in the process. You might remember there were shouts of joy and there were tears at the same time. It was an emotional time as they returned to worship. Well, today we've moved forward to Ezra chapter 6. And in moving three chapters, we've made the transition from altar that was being built there and the foundations for the temple to the temple itself. Now, our focus today, you might wonder why I've jumped from chapter 3 to 6. And that's because I felt that what God wanted us to move towards was, was here in chapter 6 today. But that... Although our focus isn't on all those bits in between, which are a mixture of opposition to the building of the temple, and there's all sorts of historical and political commentary and communication written by different kings. Although that's not our focus today, I don't want to just dismiss it. I don't want to pretend it's not there. If it's in the scripture, there's something that it has to say to us that's important. However, I think it can be summarised in the first three verses of that which Ali read to us today, reminding us that God is on the move. Reminding us that this is no isolated story in the Bible. It's part of a much bigger story. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. Firstly, we arrive in this reading today as King Darius has just secured the building of the temple after all sorts, all sorts of political shenanigans between kings and commanding officers, and there's letters going this way and letters going that way. But in the face of opposition, just as the heart of King Cyrus, right at the start of chapter one of Ezra, just as the heart of King Cyrus was moved to invite the Israelite people back, so now God moves the heart of King Darius to ensure that now they're back, the temple gets built. And this King Darius? Yes, he is the same King Darius of Daniel in the lion's den fame. Read Daniel 6, 28, and it tells you, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, another name, the Persian. What a moment. This story that we're looking at here in the Bible is happening exactly the same time as the events that happened to Daniel. God's bigger story. It doesn't end there, there though. We also discover as we, as we read those words that all of this was happening, it says, under the preaching of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah. Which means as we step on a bit further in our Bibles... There are more writings that relate to this specific moment. So God wasn't working at this time in history, wasn't only working through Zerubbabel and later Ezra and Nehemiah. God was working through Haggai and Zechariah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah too. God was on the move in all of these different people's lives because he wanted them to influence what was happening for the Israelite people. A reminder that when it comes to God, there's always more, always more going on than we might at first see. So with God's guiding hand, the temple is finished. And here it gets dedicated. And what do the people do? The people worship. Not just in one way, but in lots of ways. But before we go on and we think a little bit about worship then and what it might say to us now, let's pause for a moment. The Israelites have been away. Exiled for about 70 years, generations of people, and now suddenly they're back. All that hardship, all that time to reflect, and now they're back. Has it changed them at all? Has it changed the way they might worship God? because of the experiences that they've had, because they had time to reflect. Now, on one level, you might read this and say, well, no, it doesn't seem to have done. 
Here they are, still making sacrifices, still celebrating Passover, still doing the whole festival thing. The only real difference is that the temple they're doing it in now isn't nearly as lavish as the one that had come before. So it looks the same. But if we dig deeper, there are clues in these words that, make us, that might make us see that things are beginning to shift for the people. Firstly, the people of Israel make a sin offering. That's what it says in the word. It says they make 12 male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Now that's in addition to the sacrifices that they've made to dedicate the temple. And in these words, we get a clear indication that this is them saying, you know, Lord, we really want to begin again. We recognise we messed up. And as far as we can be sure, this looks like it was the first opportunity in 70 years for those people to recognise that their exile was down to their own sin. And this was their cleansing moment, a removal of guilt, a chance to start afresh. So that gives us a sense that things might be shifting for the Israelite people. But there's something, there's, the second, there's a second clue as well. And that's the feast of the unleavened bread. Now, if you're sitting at home going, oh yeah, of course, the feast of the unleavened bread. Yeah, I know what that was. Don't worry, I'm going to explain it. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread celebrated the journey of the Israelite people through the wilderness. Do you remember? They ate something called manna, a kind of unleavened bread, bread without any yeast in it, that means. It was bread that God provided for his people. Now, part of that festival tradition is to throw out the raised bread, the leavened bread, in preparation Literally, throw it out because I don't need that anymore because I'm starting something new. Another sign that they recognised that this was a new beginning. So things had changed a bit, or at least it seems that they had. I think we've always got to hold on to the fact with the Israelite people that these were real people. Real people like you and I, doing their best to follow God. So don't be surprised when it all goes a little bit pear-shaped in the days ahead. However, there's a real sense here that they wanted their lives, their worship, to be different. And so I sense that God's asking us to use that as the motivation to ask ourselves what's different as we return to worship in the church building, as we return from our exile. Because we'd have time to reflect too, right? So is anything different? Should anything be different? Let me share just a few thoughts with you. I think that space for reflection was God given. I sense that God has given us space to be able to think over these last few weeks and months what our worship should be, what it should look like, what it should feel like. Time away, just as the Israelite people had, to reflect on what's important. And of course, the challenge is the same to us. We have to work out as we come back, has anything changed for us at all or not? Here are some of my thoughts in response to that question. So number one. I believe that the space that we've been given to reflect is an encouragement for us to start afresh in our worship. I know last week I spoke about the Israelite people returning to old tra traditions. Now that can be good. It can feel like putting on an old pair of slippers. They feel comfortable. But what if those slippers were never really good for our feet? What if we just wore them because we'd never really known anything else? Now, in the spirit of finding the right slippers, 
I believe it's time to ask ourselves why we come together to worship and then to think about what that worship should look like. And in answer to the first part of that question, I'm going to go simple, church family, because I am pretty simple and I like it simple. The primary purpose of God's people, his church, his people together is to worship. So we come together to worship because that's what we've been called into being for. The trouble is, we tend to equate being together, being God's people, with Sundays, which implies that we only worship together when we're physically together, or we only worship when we're physically together. Whereas, church family, our whole lives, all the different activities of the church were intended for worship. That's one of the reasons that we've said for a while, and we're going to keep saying it, that we think life groups should be at the heart of who we are as a church family, at the heart of our worship. If you're not a member of a life group, or maybe your life group has just got a bit dry, perhaps there's an opportunity here for you to start afresh. So that's number one. Number two, I believe we're being called back to Scripture. Both last week and this week in our journey through Ezra, I've been struck by how the Torah, the books of the law, the first five books of the Old Testament shaped the lives of these people. Now, I know it doesn't mean we always apply it in the right way. They certainly struggled at times. But I am certain that God is calling us to be people who genuinely engage with his word, whose everyday lives are shaped by it. It's part of our worship. It's one of the things that Peter and I have already been talking about. And I know that both he and I are committed to this church being one, as we say in our values, that is Bible-centred. That's at the heart of who we are. Think of it as allowing God this opportunity to speak directly into our lives. Think of it as an opportunity to ask questions of what God is doing and how we can be part of it. Think of it not as passive reading, but of active engagement. Perhaps as we hold that Bible in our hands, whether it's a a traditional Bible or in our phones, Perhaps there's an opportunity for us to start afresh. Number three, I believe we're being called to a new season of prayer. Do you know what excites me in these words? Because you might have already spotted it. It doesn't actually mention prayer. You might think, oh, Steve's making a pretty big jump here from the words that are in the text to something that he wants to say. I'm excited about the fact that it doesn't mention prayer in that word. I'll tell you why, because I I think there's a blocker for us sometimes when it comes to prayer. We're so used to prayer being this thing which means sitting down quietly and closing our eyes, possibly being asked to pray out loud, which for many people is the scariest thing on earth. The words in Ezra don't tell, don't use the word prayer, but what they do focus on is encounters with God. And I believe that's what we get through prayer. We're opening ourselves up to an encounter with God. That's what all those festivals were. And I don't know about you, but I love the idea of us experiencing encounters with God, places to praise him, places to listen to him. Places to pour out our hearts to him. Church family, I pray that's an opportunity for us to start afresh. Number four, I believe we're being called to break bread together. We've already done that this morning. We've already talked about it with this morning. Both Ali and I have already said how this, what a special moment of remembrance and celebration this is that never loses its significance in the Bible. 
It's a place where we come again and again and again to celebrate the goodness of God. I don't think it's an accident that we saw that there they were, the Israelite people celebrating Passover. In those words we read today. I believe God is calling us as a church family to explore more ways, more occasions where we can share the bread and the wine as Jesus taught us. Now, there might well be opportunities or occasions within that where it can become less formal than we've been used to. Now, don't misunderstand me. Always appropriate, always acknowledging the significance of what we're doing, but possibly permeating our worship in new ways helping us to start afresh in our worship. So that was number four. And then finally, number five, I believe we're being called to find space together. Have you noticed that although we often say, and it's come up over the last couple of weeks, we often say that we crave the opportunity to be able to worship together again, Worship never begins as a group. Worship never begins as a group. Because it has to start in here. It has to start with our individual responses to what God has revealed to us about himself. Revelations and response that church family... Church family, we don't, they're not things that should just be for Sundays. They're revelations and responses that happen and can happen day by day if our hearts are open to that. It's one of the limitations of Sunday worship. It brings a a weekly cycle to something that's supposed to be something we experience moment by moment. Something that we keep coming back to again and again. Each time exploring something new about the character of God, about his goodness. Making worship something that happens every day in our lives. I mean, think about it. What if in this new season, we didn't go to church to worship, but we came worshipping to church? What if church was a celebration of our personal journey since, with God since the last time that we were together? What if we all sought God through the week, knowing that for some, that would mean when we got there on Sunday, that we would be bringing heaps of joy with us. And that others might be bringing tears with them. But regardless of our experiences of God, the coming back together was the opportunity to share stories of God's faithfulness in good times and bad, again and again and again. That's what being together in worship means. It's rooted in that rather old sounding word, fellowship. The word in which, which in Hebrew means sharing, participation, contribution. It is, of course, no accident that what I've outlined here mirrors the pattern set down by those in the early church, as outlined in Acts 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, the breaking of bread, and to fellowship together. So church family, just as the Israelite people did, Will you accept the invitation to come home? Not to a place, but to an encounter with God. Grabbing an everyday opportunity to start afresh. Making the decision that you want to live a life that celebrates the goodness of God, whatever it is that you have to go through. I believe that God is calling us home 
And he's calling us to make our worship about nothing but him. Have you got a picture of what you think worship should be, what, what it should look like when we come back together to the building? Aha, <laughs> million dollar question. Um, so 
in, on one, in one sense, yes, and in, in another sense, no. Um, I think the most important for me thing for me, I, I said it earlier, is just that we, we use this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I sense that God's got more for us. And that as we come back, to dive straight back in mm -hmm. to all the things that were there previously, um, if we do that too quickly and without thought, could be a mistake. Yeah. And, and the, the, uh, as I say, I think these things happen for a reason. I mm -hmm. think God's trying, you know, he's shaking us up a bit through it. Um, and so there will be some things that I think it's important to come back to familiarity mm -hmm. as well. It's finding the balance within that. Yeah. So there will be elements. Absolutely. Will it feel like church? Yes, it will mm -hmm. feel like church. Really important. But it's about finding the space to encounter God in new ways. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost count in this church family with a, num with a number of conversations I've had with people where they say, I, I really want more of the spirit. Yeah. Well, if as a church we want more of the spirit, then we've got to create spaces for that. Yeah. And that, may that maybe mean that we have to do things differently on a Sunday morning or find mm -hmm. other times yeah. times to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know like the, the, um, this is a book called The Infographic <laughs> Bible, okay? <laughs> if you haven't seen this and you love diagrams and statistics, you need to get hold of it. So the reason I've got it here today is partly because I knew we were talking about different types of worship and this was an amazing way for me to get into the Bible, but it's because Ali pointed me towards <laughs> it, right? Because Ali, you, you'd seen this. Yeah, I, I've had it for a while. I can't remember where I... I, I think I saw it. I'm just thinking. I think I saw it on a friend's coffee table at their house. I picked it up and started looking at it and thought, this is amazing. Bought it for myself and then recommend yeah. it to lots of people because it is, it's, it's just a really different way of looking at uh, aspects and concepts in the Bible. And um, yeah, it's good. <laughs> but, and that, but crucially, you know, again, you know, one of the things that we t I was talking about in the message was engaging with the yeah. word. This has enabled me to engage with, with God, yeah. to worship in ways that I don't think I could ever, yeah. I, I would have done otherwise. I mean, even being able to pictorially see yeah. Solomon's temple, right? <laughs> uh, you know, we've been talking about that, but you know, the, these images of Solomon's wealth, yeah. or but then you go through to some of the things that the Pentecost and the coming of the spirit and how it happens, yeah. and but done with lots of little figures of people. So you can see how many people were impacted yeah. by the spirit. It's just such a different yeah. way. It's amazing. I, I just think, you know, people have done the research and they've done all this work. So and now we have it sort of available yeah. to us. Let's use it and let's look at it and enjoy it. And, and yeah, get into and it's it. stuff like this, I think, that is the <laughs> example of what I think church family. There are different ways that we can find God. Mm -hmm. And um, I've loved that. I'd absolutely. We'll, we'll put it on the website or whatever so that you, you can uh, uh, you can find it to, for yourself. But. That's what worship is. It's mm -hmm. encounters with God. Yeah. And uh, the more that together, I think, that we can do that, yeah. the more we're going to be the people that God's calling us to be. Yeah, right? absolutely. And creating space to talk about what God's done in our lives and, and what, you know, get just um, having that opportunity to share testimonies and, and things would be so good to, yeah. to do more of that. Um, yeah, I, um, I absolutely agree. I think <laughs> there's, there's so much space for it. For people who are ready to share, you know, again, yeah. you know, we're not we're not going to no. demand that everybody share. <laughs> Stick a microphone under yeah. all, everyone's uh, faces. But but we know when we hear those stories of whether they're ones of people in really challenging situations, mm -hmm. but, or sometimes fantastic situations, yeah. um, just what a difference it makes. Next week, I'm going to be sharing uh, a couple of things. We're talking about how God protects next week, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a pastor, another pastor in. Um, Milton Keynes, known as Pastor B, Pastor who B. <laughs> you might have known was really ill with COVID. We prayed mm -hmm. for him here mm -hmm. and he was, he was super, super ill. Uh, I sat on a meeting this week where he shared his testimony yeah. and it blew the room away. Yeah. It's going to blow you away next <laughs> week because I'm going to share a bit of it. But it, yeah. they're the things that, that change us, yeah. that remind us of how good God yeah. is. Yeah, so encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going I'm to pray uh, as, as we close this morning. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, thank you that we are able to have encounters with you. Thank you that we are able to come into your presence and that we don't have to keep our distance. But you invite us 
to come boldly up to your throne, to be there at your feet. Father God, I pray that in these coming days, in the weeks ahead, that you will lead us and guide us in the way that you would have us go so that we might find new ways to encounter you in our worship. Or perhaps, Lord, we're going to take existing ways of worship, things we love, and you're going to help us just uh, experience you as we, as, as we go back to some of the things we've missed. Thank you, Father God, that the Creator of this universe, of everything that we know, seeks relationship with us. Lord, in those moments, we just, you know, in every bit of our lives, we just want to give you everything. We want to thank you for all that you are. And I pray, Lord, that for, for our church family, that you will lead us and guide us, even this week, Father God, that we will know your voice speaking into our lives. You will bring comfort where that's needed. You'll bring peace where that's needed. You'll bring rest, Father God, where that is needed. I pray you'll bring wisdom to those who need wisdom. I pray you'll bring healing to those who need healing. Father God, lead us and guide us. Thank you that you are everything to us. We love you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you, church family. Thank you, Ali. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, great. <laughs> yes, it's been awesome. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And a reminder that uh, if you want to um, share in church online, we love that. If you want to share in church in the building, we love that too. Uh, you simply need to register uh, online at uh, the church website and you can make sure that you secure your place for a Sunday morning in the building. Um, numbers are starting to go up. I've said before, if there is a lot of demand for Sunday mornings, then we'll do more than one service. Um, it's only three weeks, though. Four weeks. Four weeks. <laughs> and we'll be back together again. Have a good week, everybody. See you soon. Take care. Bye. See ya.